Okay, everyone, welcome back to the third and final part of Ask the King, episode 49. If you didn't see the first two parts, definitely check them out. But we're moving right ahead with the finale of our question. So let's push ahead as strongly as we can. That's my motto. All right, next question. This one is from Christian. And he says, hey, Phil, I hope everything's going well. One question since you started doing uh, the DSP's best and worst series recently. Will you go back to doing some of your best and worst playthroughs, like Heavy Rain, Alan Wake? Probably do them during your free time, like the summer. It will make it easier for new-time viewers to see your all over your work. Long-time fan, and I hope you can successfully achieve your goals this year. Uh, I'm not going to lie, this has been a, uh, an idea. Now that I am doing video editing a lot more, uh, that has popped up. Uh, some people have actually suggested that this be a Patreon goal. That if I hit a certain amount of funding, I take a couple days off. And instead of doing new games, I go back through my old classic playthroughs. I file through them, watching them. I pick great moments and I do an awesome edited montage of that gameplay. Um, here's my thoughts on the matter. I, I think absolutely that it would make sense for me to take these playthroughs, a lot of which a lot of people haven't even checked out because they're so old at this point, and make them fresh again through editing and stuff, I think that would be a cool idea. Um, I have to understand, though, those playthroughs aren't going to look great. Those were filmed with a 720p uh, camera with not good uh, lighting settings, you know, aimed at a TV, and it's definitely, the commentary is going to be very echoey, way more echoey than it sounds today. The visuals aren't going to be on par with something that I do today. And people would have to understand, this is a really old playthrough, okay? Um, in addition to that, you have to realize that with the business, it is a business. And it's like, as much as I'd like to reminisce on the past, you also have to constantly be covering what's new and what's hot in the, in the present and future. So I can't just say, oh, I'm just going to live on my past laurels and undo highlights, nonstop highlights of my old classic stuff, right? But I could <clears throat> do from time to time a montage of, you know, those playthroughs. I think that might be a good thing. Should it be a Patreon goal? I don't know. Maybe it could be like during the summer months when times are slow, I take one or two days off to go back through one of my favorite playthroughs or ones that the fans have deemed one of their favorites and I pick cool highlighted moments and I do a highlight reel. The thing is for a lot of those playthroughs, they're long. Like for example, Fallout 3, um, any of the Mass Effects that I've played, those are longer playthroughs. You're talking 12 plus hours. Is one montage of 10 minutes enough to highlight that. No, maybe it could be like an ongoing series. The best of Mass Effect 2 Part 1. And the next week, the best of Mass Effect 2 Part 2. And I highlight all these funny things that happen during the next session or something like that. It's an idea. <clears throat> it's a good idea. It's not something I'm definitely saying I'm going to do. I'd like your feedback if you think it's a good idea. Is that something that you would like to see now that I have better video editing capabilities and I'm working on it more? <clears throat> okay. Next question. This is from Dan and Laura. They say, hey, Phil, we live in Portland, Oregon, and we've been fans of yours for many years, so we're super stoked to hear that you were moving out here to the Pacific Northwest. Will you be doing any cons on the West Coast this year? We'd love to have an opportunity to meet up with you and thank you personally for all the years of entertainment, and also both of us are staff at several cons in the area, so if you'd like to come visit Portland and be a guest at one of our conventions, we'd be more than happy to facilitate. First of all, that is an awesome invite, Dan and Laura. So thank you for the invite before I even respond. That's awesome that you would do that. Um, the answer is yes, we are attending a convention at the end of March. I've not talked about this very frequently, so I'm not surprised you guys haven't heard about it yet. We're going to be attending Emerald City Comic Con. It's the comic convention that's in our backyard right over here in downtown Seattle, okay? We have a three-day pass. We're not sure what day or days we're going to be there yet. As we get closer to the event, <clears throat> we'll be able to give you guys more information on that, okay? And, I mean, by all means, we're not going to... No, we don't have a booth there. No, we're not doing a panel. We're just there as attendees. But if anyone notices us and recognizes us and wants to say hello, wants to shake my hand, wants to possibly get an autograph, etc., I'd be more than willing to do that for you guys, okay? So, Emerald City Comic Con, more information coming on that in the next few weeks as we build up to it. That is the last weekend of March, and we'll be there, okay? Now, as for other conventions, first of all, Portland, Oregon is actually... In this area, the Pacific Northwest of the country, one of the biggest hotspots. There's Portland, Oregon, there's Seattle, Washington, and there is, is it Vancouver? I want to say that it's Vancouver that's right to the north of us. Just a hop, skip, and a jump over the border into Canada. These are like the three big areas, the big touristy areas in this area of the United States. Okay, well, of course, the one that's across in Canada isn't in the United States, but you get my drift. These are the touristy areas in this region of the world. Um, 
and we were interested in going to Portland because we've heard lots of popular things and there's lots of fun stuff to do. That would be a cool vacation for us, I think, for us to go to Portland and spend a few days there and go around and doing stuff. And a convention would definitely be something we would consider. However, I'm going to tell you this right now. I've already mentioned this before. We're very tight on money this year. You know, there's a very definitive reason why I'm in the process of selling my statue collection, why Leanna's about to launch a brand new business, why I've got a Patreon that just launched. We need funds right now, number one, to pay my taxes, number two, to help us pay down all the debt that we accrued when we were moving across the country, and number three, to help out because right now my viewership on YouTube has dwindled over the years because I think, you know, a lot of stagnation, right? I was doing the same thing. I wasn't keeping up with the times. People have blatantly told me you should have done editing, you should have done montages, you should have done all these things, and you didn't do them, and people moved on from your work. So I'm trying to get some of that back this year in addition to juggling all these financial responsibilities. Unfortunately, we don't have any money for travel in the budget. We went on a little mini staycation to Seattle earlier this month. That's it until the end of the year when we're actually going to be going to Leanna's brother's uh, uh, wedding, which is going to be on the East Coast in uh, Pennsylvania in November sometime. So we're going to have to pay for a cross-country flight and hotel stay and all that then. So that's it for this year. Would I consider in the future going to Portland, Oregon and doing a convention and or tourism is up? Absolutely 100% yes. It's one of the things we're actually looking forward to. We're actually looking forward. We want to do Portland. We want to do the LA Hollywood area at one point. And we're even looking to go even maybe a little further south than that eventually because all those things now are much closer to us than they were when we lived on the East Coast. They're cheaper. They're going to be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to taking in the West Coast. We just can't do it right now. We have to pay off some stuff before we can get there. Okay, but thank you for your offer, and I hope that when it comes time for that, in a year or two, hopefully, when things are a little bit better financially, we can talk about that again. Okay. All right, next question is from Ghost23, longtime viewer, and he says, Hey, Phil, why don't you do more release day unboxing videos? Well, fair point. Let's bring this up. Release day unboxing ended. It ended last year, right at the beginning of the hardcore gaming season. Because I decided that there was no reason to do unboxing videos anymore. I'll show you why. You ready? Here's why. Dragon Ball Xenoverse. Here it is. Wow. A pre-order or a code for, you know, a DLC and that's it. That's, that's the box. Release the unboxing. Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. Wow. Look at all that. Times have changed, guys. You know, it's not... 2009 2010 anymore and sadly over the course of the the six years that i've done this on youtube there's nothing to do with unboxing anymore you know what i mean there's just there's no unboxing that's worth doing because the boxes don't even look that good there's nothing inside there's nothing to show off ideally what ended up happening was i would open it up wow look there's all this stuff to show off or i buy a collector's edition and i'll be honest i don't get as many views i don't make as much money as i used to and i don't buy the collector's editions anymore I just can't afford them, right, to put in that much money into the games. Um, and when it comes down to it, uh, really what was coming, turning my unboxings were turning into basically me talking about the game or the history of the game series rather than me unboxing anything. So I did, know, I did mention this last year. I said one of the new series I would like to start is called Game Day. We're on a new release day, so say a Tuesday in America anyway, in the United States, I would sit here and I would have the box. I'd show you the games quickly, but it would be more about me explaining my background with the games and what I'm anticipating for the playthrough and how I'm going to cover that game that week. It didn't happen. It didn't happen for multiple reasons. Number one, there haven't been a lot of retail releases this year. I think I've gone to GameStop twice this year. Like, seriously, I've gone there twice since the beginning of 2013, uh, 2013, 2015. That's two months, and I've only had to go to GameStop twice, and usually it was just pick up one game. So, in that regards, <clears throat> there's really not that much to show off or talk about. A lot of the things I've been doing have been kind of downtime stuff. The whole first month of the year was me doing year, uh, Game of the Year awards and year-end series, right? Now that new games are coming out, like I said, I find I, I haven't had the time to do it. Uh, would I like to do it? It would be called Game Day, not Release Day Unboxing. Yes, I would like to do the series, but I need to have time to do it, and I just haven't found the time. Maybe I will. We'll have to see. Okay? All right. Next question is from uh, Richard P. from Texas. He says, A uh, long-time viewer, and I need some advice. I'm 29 years old, and my girlfriend and I are purchasing our first home. Uh, we have been together for four years and we're excited about having found a perfect home for us and we're about a week away from moving in. 
Uh, I was just wondering if you had any helpful tips on what to expect during the move in process. Uh, considering that you just went through this situation. We currently only live about 10 miles from the new home. Unlike your move, where you had to move across the country, ours should be at least much easier in that regard. Anyway, how long did it take for you to get settled in? Were there any surprises that you encountered along the way? Any other tips that you could give us? It would be much appreciated. Thanks, and keep up the funny and entertaining content. Um, Good question. <clears throat> uh, what I would say is this. Uh, you're going to have things that are going to come up that you never expected, right? When we moved in here, immediately, oh, water damage in the ceiling as soon as it starts raining after the, the hot summer was over. The fact that when we moved in, it was an effing hot summer out of nowhere. We weren't expecting it. You're not supposed to have hot weather here, and we were cooking in our offices, right? Um, for us, we didn't really feel settled in until several months after we moved here because keep in mind, we had to get lots and lots of furniture, to, fur for, uh, to uh, furnish the house. I had to get my setup here working, my new PC, my new setup, all set up and working. And really, it took several months. We moved in in June. I'd probably say it wasn't until almost September where I finally said, okay, I feel like we're finally kind of settled in and everything is as it's going to be. We're not making any additional improvements or things aren't going to really change too much about the house. It's going to take months to, to do that. It also took months for us to get used to a work schedule, to get used to a meal schedule, you know? It was different. We had to adjust now. Two people living together. One makes the meals. One's, you know, on, on this streaming and work schedule and working things around that and having time to spend together while we're also having our own things going on in our own lives. Uh, one thing that I will say is this. <clears throat> A critical thing, an absolutely critical thing that you need to know about living with someone for the first time is it comes with cooperation and time sharing. And what I mean by that is you know there's going to be things you have to do in the house. Someone has to pay the bills. Someone has to clean the house. Someone has to cook the meals. Someone has to take the trash out. Someone has to do this, do this, do this. There has to be leisure time. The best thing you could do is to divvy those out immediately, right? So that there's an understanding of how it's going to work. Not that, well, we're living here now. How do we eat? Do you know how to cook? Well, I know a few meals, but, you know, well, it looks like we're eating out every day. You know what I mean? You got to figure this out. What we did, we had a baseline, different meals that we wanted to try. Leanna immediately jumped online and started looking and said, oh, this one sounds interesting. I'll try these. We tried some. Some were great. Some didn't work out that well. And now that we've lived here for, you know, half a year, we've got a good baseline of, say, maybe 12 meals or so that we can rotate between, and they're easy to make. And not a lot of work and not a lot of cleanup so that she can cook and we can eat and have a good dinner every day in between my gameplay streams. And that's what it's going to be. Sharing out the responsibilities. One person has to be doing this. One person does this. If one person's better at numbers, maybe they should take care of the finances. If one person's better at physical work, they should be doing that, etc., etc., etc. It's like co-op in real life. <laughs> so there you have it. Hopefully that will help you guys. All right, next question is from Haseo X4. He says, hey, Phil, what are your thoughts on Kingdom Hearts 3 pre-orders? Many stores, for example, Target, are letting you pre-order the game even though there's no release date and no one has any idea when the hell it's coming out. If you go to gaming stores like GameStop, they don't have any information on release dates at all, but you could still still take your money. From what I heard, it might not come out till 2017 unless it makes a presence at E3 this year. Also, will you play other Kingdom Hearts games on handhelds or will you wait for the HD remakes, etc.? Um, <clears throat> I've always thought that being able to pre-order a game before the game has a release date is ludicrous, alright? It is a blatant way for people to steal your money. And I say that with the 100% assurance that that's what it is. Let me take your money for something that you don't even have a guarantee will ever exist just so we can hold your money. And that's what GameStop does. If you put your money down for Kingdom Hearts 3 right now, what does GameStop do with your money? Do you think they have it? No. It's spent. It's gone. You just paid them $5 to do absolutely nothing. Now, in two years' time, maybe the game will come out, and yeah, then they'll put the $5 credit towards your game. But guess what? Money depreciates over time. In two years, $5 is worth less than it's worth right now, present day. So they made money on your investment. You invested in GameStop by giving them money two years ahead of time for a game that doesn't exist. Their games that I actually pre-ordered uh, at GameStop and other places, right? And the games didn't come out. There was one of them was Prey 2. It was the sequel to Prey. It was supposed to come out two years ago. It got delayed, 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 and never came out. 
And my money is in infinitely floating around in a GameStop database. And it's like, well, you know they spent that money, right? There's no reason. There's no reason to pre-order games that far ahead of time. A lot of reasons today, there's no reason to pre-order at all. Every game has a digital release day one. Why do you need to pre-order it? It's not like the old days where if you didn't pre-order ahead of time, you couldn't play the game on release date. It's all over the internet now. So as long as you have quick internet, why are you ever pre-ordering a game unless you want one of those stupid pre-order bonuses, DLC things, which we've talked about and I disagree with. So uh, I think it's, it's criminal. Honestly, it's criminal. It's a way for them to take your money and you spend it and give you zero value for it with no guarantee it ever will. It's a joke, and no one should be pre-ordering stuff that, that long ahead of time, okay? All right. Next question is from uh, God Re Revan. God Revan. I, I really wish I knew how to pronounce that, because if it's Revan or Revane, I'm going to basically get cat shit. But anyway, this question is, uh, here we go. Uh, recently, a Santa Monica Studio developer, his name was Dean Reimer, went on Twitter and threatened to take down advertisements for the Order 1886 on popular gaming review websites because such websites had given the game low review scores. He went on to say that the mainstream gaming media is so hateful that he believes that they shouldn't be buying ads from them for their games and we shouldn't be sending you review copies of the games if you're going to be dicks. The Order 1886 isn't the best game that he's ever played, but it's well made and it's not a 6 out of 10 and no one should be reviewing his game like that. He wonders why they even bother sending people review copies to begin with. My question is, what do you think of this situation from Santa Monica Studios? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if ever I've been right about something, this past year has 100% proven I was right when I said the reason that these mainstream developers are getting review copies of their games is because it's the expectation they're going to fucking inflate the score. I first mentioned this with the review of Halo ODST, where all the mainstream websites said that it was like an 8 or 9 out of 10, but when you played the game, it was incredibly short, the shortest Halo experience ever. You could tell it was supposed to be a DLC, it was poorly executed, and it was an overpriced $60 piece of shit. And I called them out in my review of Halo ODST and said, this is bullshit. Stop letting mainstream media be bought out. But here's what happened. There's been a flip. Mainstream gaming media, for the most part, isn't catering to these people anymore. Now, if you get a Call of Duty, yeah, they'll always give that shit 9 out of 10 because that's the biggest money maker in the gaming world right now. When you get a game like The Order 1886, gaming media has stopped kissing studios' asses. So regardless of the fact that the studio sold them ads or whatever, you know what I mean, and they made money on it, they decided that they are not going to let the studios basically get away with crap anymore. So you review a game like The Order, and IGN reviewed the game and gave it a 6.5 out of 10, and this game developer went nuts on Twitter basically revealing that he doesn't think he should ship them review copies anymore if they're going to pan the game. Which is exactly what I said in the Halo ODST review how long ago that that's the reason why these game are, are these uh, game media places are getting advanced copies in the expectation that they're going to kiss the game's ass. So here's what I have to say about that. The same thing I had to say back then. No one should get advanced copies of games. No one deserves them. No one's entitled enough to deserve one. All it does is skew popular opinion about a fucking game before people actually have a hands-on experience. I would believe the opinion of a common gamer who plays a game and tells me about it 20 billion times more than the hack journalists they have working in mainstream gaming media who have a pissy fit about a certain part of the game and rate it low or have an editor, which I mentioned earlier on in this episode of Ask the King, who doesn't do their fucking job and doesn't scale the scores appropriately. I don't think that anyone should get an advanced copy. Everyone should fucking have to line up. Everyone should have to buy the fucking game. Everyone should have to play the game on day one, judge for themselves. Enough of this. Enough of giving advanced copies out in a crooked expectation that your game's going to get an amazingly good game review. Fuck game developers who need to get that kind of padding to sell a lackluster game. The Order 1886 is a perfect example of a game that was a polished turd, but they polished it up so much, spent so much money on advertising, and sent so many advanced copies out to game reviewers in the expectation they'd get their ass kissed, and they didn't. Fuck that. We need to know the truth now. Enough with the crooked gaming media, and I don't think that any advanced copies should be sent out fucking period. <clears throat> Thank you.
And I would like to let you guys know, just so you guys are clear, I've been offered advanced copies of games before. There's been several opportunities where I've been given advanced, uh, either the opportunity to get a game ahead of time or play a game ahead of time. And after a while, I, there was a there was actually a, a, man, a manager, a guy who managed YouTubers, and he said, you have the following that I can get you all these games ahead of time. And I told him no, because I said, I will be the common person. I will get in line like everyone else. I will play it on day one. We'll all experience the game together, and then I'll give my honest opinion. I'm not going to rush out and try to get an advanced copy and have to kiss a game's ass because of this bullshit. I pride myself on being honest and transparent. If I were honest and transparent, I wouldn't want to do this anymore. And I honestly think that over the years, there were lots of opportunities that I've had being on YouTube and being popular the way I was at one point that I squandered. There were many, op I, had, I had contracts, I had people do this, advertise this, and I didn't do it. I wanted to be true to myself, and here I am today where I am, being myself. And that's why with all the bullshit, I'm okay being myself and doing what I'm doing because I'm not going to sell out, right? You may see me get cool at opportunities. I will always be transparent. I just this past week got into the Loot Crate Partnership Program. Did I not tell you? No. The first thing I did in my latest Loot Crate unboxing, I told you about it up front so you would understand the premise of the unboxing. And I'm not going to kiss Loot Crate's ass. If we get a month with a shitty Loot Crate, I'm going to tell you. But that's me, and that's who I am. And I know if I kiss Loot Crate's ass and I said it was the best thing on the planet, probably 100 people would sign up for it and I'd make a ton of money. I'm not going to do that. That's me. Those game journalists aren't me, all right? They're in it to have a journalism paycheck. So if it means saving their job by kissing a game's ass, that's what they're going to fucking do. I don't have to do that. Okay. And now, Twitter, Facebook questions, which we'll go through very quickly. First of all, a bunch of people asked me about the net, net neutrality update today. For those of you who didn't hear or weren't following me on Twitter, I talked about it this morning. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the United States of America, has voted and approved that the Internet is now considered a commodity slash a uh, utility, which means that internet companies like Comcast in particular and other ones cannot create internet fast lanes where people can only use fast websites or high bandwidth websites like Netflix or uh, <clears throat> YouTube or Twitch. If you pay extra money, that's not the case. You can't. They can't do that anymore. They can't censor things. So, for example, they were worried that Comcast might censor other websites that are related to their competitors. They can't do that anymore. We've passed the initial hurdle. Unfortunately, we've got a few new hurdles. Because here's what happens in, co com uh, com companies, in countries where this happens. Now the government regulates it. The government is now regulating the Internet in the United States. Okay? What could happen is now they overregulate it. Now the Internet ends up getting slower. Now they, the, the government themselves start censoring things. That's not what we want. We want... It to basically remain the same, free and open how it is, yes, you can add some regulation, but don't go overboard and overregulate it, because unfortunately, there's two ways this could go. The internet could be amazing and be as good as it is and improve, or it could go the other way and get slower and be censored and regulated, and we don't know what's going to happen. It all basically depends on how much faith do you have in the United States government. Based on their track record, you know what I mean? It could go, it could be hit or miss. A lot of times in the past few years, they just were making really stupid decisions on the internet that were based on this instead of on knowledge of what the internet is and or was. And we basically, as people, had to speak up in these social movements and shut down the government things to, to regulate and do shitty things about the internet multiple times in the past six years that I've done this for YouTube. Now what's going to happen now that this is happening? I don't know. We're going to have to see. <clears throat> okay. From Caesar to Pleaser, he says, Hey, Phil, any progress in the things that you want to do and achieve this year? Bonus question, what will, we sp will you be sponsored by C Selson Blue? No, I don't think I'll ever be sponsored by Selson Blue. I don't even use Selson Blue, which is kind of funny because I do bring it up at sometimes in playthroughs, but it's few and far between. Updates on where I am this year. <clears throat> I ver very much feel that my montages, best worst, and now my game reviews are going to be excellent because I've got this new video editing software and I've committed myself to taking time to use it. And so far, the feedback's been overwhelmingly positive. Hasn't seen like a tremendously great uh, flood of attention or views outside of my hardcore fan base, but maybe that'll change in time. I don't know, okay? I hate to say it. I think a lot of people, oh, Phil's editing finally? Well, fuck it. I'm still not going to watch it. Even though this is what they've demanded for years, now I do it. But now they're of the mentality that everything I do is wrong and they're not going to watch it. Hopefully we can convert some of those people, okay? In regards to... <clears throat> 
the level of quality of my games, uh, gaming footage, it's great. 60 frames per second. I'm playing games now, and it look amazing when I upload on the YouTube. The streaming has improved. People are now getting used to me streaming on YouTube. I'm getting more and more people turning out for the streams and stream chat than I did when I first started, and people are starting to convert over and like it. I like that too, all right? Shortcomings. I haven't had a chance to work on Project 7 at all this year. I haven't had a chance to work on Game Day. I haven't had a chance to work on my movie-related series, and I haven't had a chance to work on that other vlogging series, the creative one that I told you guys about. I just haven't had a chance. I was working on the year-end stuff. This month of February, I focused on continuing on with gameplay, but also taking time out to do these edited montages and putting footage into the reviews, and it took time away, and now I don't have time to work on the other stuff. I'm only one man. People need to realize that I am one person. I'm not a team like a lot of these other popular YouTubers. They have other people that work for them, or they're teams of people that work. I myself, I've always been a one-man army. I can only do so much with the time that I have. <clears throat> I'm working hard. I hope you guys have seen that improvement and also my new positivity. I'm really trying to stay away from the negativity and just stay positive and moving forward positively, okay? Um, if anything, the Patreon launch last week was an overwhelming success, and we'll find out in just a couple days how successful it was. If we can keep it near or on that level every month, that's going to significantly free me up from being so worried about views every month, and let's hope... Thumbs up that it does stay at least around to this level of success that it is. And let's hope that we can have creative goals and projects every month coming out of it. I think March is going to be a unique and fun month because of the goals that we've reached and the special things I'm going to be doing in March as a direct result of Patreon. Okay. Next question is from Arrow03. He says, where do you see yourself five years from now? Marriage, possibly kids, and what do you think the future holds from you? I wish I could answer these questions, and people ask me these kind of questions all the time, and I never can answer them because I don't know. My life is one of the most uncertain lives of anyone that's probably ever living on the planet Earth. I don't have a consistent, or I don't want to say consistent, I don't have a, uh, not even steady isn't the word. Because the bottom line is, no matter what you do right now, the economy in a lot of the places in the world is uncertain, Right? And you could lose it overnight. I didn't never imagine in 2010 when I got laid off from my office job that I've been working there for almost five years that I was going to get laid off. There was no signs, nothing. It just happened overnight. So regardless of what I do, there's going to be an air of uncertainty. I have no idea if the things that I'm doing this year, including the Patreon, including the changes to my content, Leanna about to launch her own business, are these things going to equate into, you know profits so that I can pay my bills, get everything paid down, and we can get to a level where I don't have to worry about that shit anymore? Or is it going to be years of hardship? I don't know. Uh, would, I love to, would I like to get married? Yes. Would I like to eventually have kids? Sure. But I can't financially, in, in any way, shape, or form, say that those things are feasible right now. I need to get to that level before I even start thinking about them. That's how I've always been. I'm, I'm a very pragmatic person. I'm not going to say, oh, I, I just pipe dream. Let's go get married and spend all this money. I can't do that. You know? If anything, the move across the country was the huge leap for me, and now I need to realistically get settled in and be able to afford everything before I can say I'd love to get married and have kids, I start my own business, which I talked about in this episode of Ask the King. Would I love to open a restaurant? Sure. Realistically, is it ever going to happen? I have no effing clue. You know, and that's kind of it. It's an unstable, uncertain kind of a deal, and that's my life. That's the story of my life at this point for the past six years. Next question is from Die James. Wow. And he says, based off a of track record alone, are you more excited for Naughty Dog, Rockstar, or Bethesda to announce a new game at E3 this year? <sighs> Tough one. I love Naughty Dog. I love the games that they put out. 99% of the time you play a game from Naughty Dog, you know it's going to be pretty good. Uh, Uncharted, one of the best gaming series of the past console generation by far. Rockstar, I'd say about 98% of the time when they put something out, you know it's going to be pretty good. I've loved Bully. I love the Grand Theft Auto series. I love Red Dead Redemption. Uh, they, you know, they published L.A. Noir, And then you've got Max Payne 3, which I really did not like. So it's kind of five great games, one game I didn't particularly like. You know what I mean? Uh, Bethesda. I mean, again, this is a company that publishes a lot develops way less. But the things that come out of Bethesda, like Elder Scrolls, Fallout, if they announce Fallout 4 this year and it looks semi-decent, this could be the thing 
that blows gaming out of the water. This could be the one, right? We've been waiting since the launch of the new consoles for a game that everyone needs to run out and buy. Fallout 4 could be the game if done right, and I'm very excited to see how this works. I want an amazing... I think that could be one of my best playthroughs of all time, just because of the nature of the game. People have said Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, some of the best stuff I've ever put out waiting for another great game like that Skyrim. You know what I mean? Same style of game, only fantasy setting. I am very stoked for Fallout 4. Please let them announce that at E3. So overall, I have to say Bethesda. Please give us Fallout 4 or another amazing Elder Scrolls. Give us something to get hype about because I'm ready to be hype. And I've been so deflated over the disappointments recently. Okay. Um, from Godzilla2055. Uh, will I ever do the other episodes of D4? For those who don't know, it's Dark Dreams Don't Die, the episodic game from uh, the same guy who made... Um, Oh, God, I can't remember the name of it now. I'm sure people in the stream chat are going to go bonkers in a second. Cause I, oh, Deadly Premonition. From the maker of Deadly Premonition, he made this game. Um, Did they ever come out? You know what I mean? I bought episode one of D D4. I loved it. Not a lot of people did, apparently. They don't like that weird, quirky style of game. I loved it. And I hope that people, you know, will support the game. But I don't know. Did they ever come out? I never heard about the other episodes coming out. If they did, I want to play them. But I didn't hear. I was actually told that the D4 sold so poorly, they may never make the new episodes. So there you have it. Um, uh, let's see here. I got I to gotta wrap this up. I'm going to skip a couple quick questions here and wrap it up. Uh, oh, from Sloth1990, am I ever going to get around to playing Assassin's Creed Rogue? Sure. That's something I could definitely do during the downtime. If you look, there's some big downtime coming up. April, May, June. There's basically like one to two major games those months and nothing else. Typically, the summer's a slow time. I have Assassin's Creed Rogue. I want to play Assassin's Creed Rogue, but I haven't had a chance to. So, I definitely want to play that during downtime, okay? Um, Other questions I got que asked. Am I ever going to play Jack 3? Uh, am I ever going to play... Uh, Ratchet and Clank, uh, I guess three or is it two? Whatever one I didn't play, I don't know. Uh, I enjoyed playing the retro versions of those games. I don't know. It might be too soon to be doing those. Maybe another couple of years I'll do them, but I don't know if I'm going to do them that simple or that quickly. Okay. Um, let's see. Will we see, oh, from Ned 1989, will Drake Has No Talent be returning to sports games this year? I think this may be a year where I take off from most sports games. Uh, the last year, I pretty much did them all, including Madden, uh, NHL. No, I didn't do NHL. I did uh, NFL, which was Madden. I said Madden already. I'm an idiot. Uh, FIFA. Thank you. That was the one I couldn't remember. I did NBA. And let's be honest, they didn't really do too well. People were like, these are boring. And to do those games once every few years, maybe, when there's a change in them or whatever, to mix it up, that might make sense. I think this year I'm probably going to forego most sports games. Now, there may be some exceptions, like UFC, people really liked last year. So maybe it's worth it to try that again this year, but I think for the most part, I'm going to stay away from sports. Okay? Um, and then, the final question, ladies and gentlemen. From in before ever 6 says, Since moving and in hindsight, is there anything that you miss about the East Coast that you did not realize that you would miss about the East Coast? Um, honestly, no. Everything that I miss about the East Coast, I pretty much thought I would. My parents, not being able to see them all the time is obvious. Uh... Seeing John Rambo and Howard, being able to do cooperative gameplay with John Rambo every week in our, our Smart Guy show, being able to even see Howard every once in a while, OJ every once in a while, that kind of sucks, right? And the food. I'll be honest. Italian food, I miss it. I love eating these delicious pasta dishes, these chicken par, veal par, the delicious East Coast style pizza that I'm used to, and there's nothing like that out here, and it's very disappointing, and that's what I miss the most. But outside of that, this year... On the east coast of the United States, one of the worst, if not the worst, snow year ever. They had so much fucking snow, and I had none of that. I've had mild weather out here. I didn't have to pick up a shovel or worry about it at all. Ridiculously night and day from when I lived on the east coast. We're, we're able to go out every Saturday. We don't have to worry about being snowed in and shit. It's too much. It's too good of an improvement. I definitely made the move the time when I needed to. Because if I didn't, and I had that year... This year in snow, and not being able to go out and get games, not being able to even get food or nothing, it would have been a fucking nightmare, and I'm glad that I moved when I did. No, there really hasn't been any unexpected things that I've missed. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. 
I thank you guys very much for watching uh, Ask the King. Went a little bit long this time, but that's fine. Please remember, submit your questions on thekingofhate.com for next month's episode. And remember, Patreon is now in effect. And if you do become that certain tier of Patreon, you have an incredibly increased chance to get your question answered. And eventually I will answer one of your questions if you do hit that level. Check it out, patreon.com forward slash darksidephil. That's it for Ask the King, everyone. Thank you very much for watching, whether if it was on live stream or YouTube. I'll see you for... A new episode next month. Episode 50. It's going to be the epic anniversary. It's going to be pretty good. I hope you'll be here for it. Peace out, everybody. Where the hell? I can't... Where is this? Is this it? That's not it. Where is it? No. There it is.